Israel. And he wants you to do that, and he will allow you to do that, to win souls for the Lord. At this time, I please welcome Brother Ruben Adigion. I said wrong, please forgive me. And welcome him as he gets the name of the word. Okay, let's give him a word to him. for this opportunity and this invitation to be here and also to thank our brother Sam for facilitating everything. We are really very grateful for brother Tony for also coming along. Um, we haven't seen brother Sam for a very long time now, so, so I'm so glad to see him and the family and uh, we are really very grateful for uh, this opportunity. Uh, I must commend the fact that you guys know how to sing. In fact, I've seen that so many, so many times I've come here. And it's really very really exciting because when we come into the presence of God, one of the things the Bible tells us is there shall be shouts of joy in the tabernacle of the righteous. And that is why we need to sing. I mean, we need to come before His presence. The Bible says we thank Him in our hearts. And that is why we need to sing praises to God every time. And to also recognize that God is a faithful God. I know the trials and difficulties we go through every day. Pain, agony, accidents, troubles. It looks like every time you turn on the news, there's no good news anymore. It's all bad news. It's all shootings and killings and trouble everywhere. And that's why sometimes I wonder why you do desire to be president. Because it's like it's trouble you come to listen to every day. Have you seen the great hair of uh, President Obama? Before he went there, I mean, he was looking younger. But now he's looking like an old man. But somebody else is sitting down there looking for this same position. Right? And that is to tell us what the world is putting into. It can never get better. Because the Bible tells us at the end of time, this is what is going to happen. But our greatest joy is to expect that Jesus will soon be here. Right. And then all these troubles, trials and difficulties will be over. I, I'm sure if you watch the news, you would have seen what's happening in my own country. Trouble. People are scared to come to church. Because they're not sure you are coming back out of that church building alive. Because somebody might be sitting somewhere with a bone tied to the waist. And all they are waiting for is just for the church to be filled up and the judge to meet it. They kill themselves and kill so many people. Hundreds, thousands have died. And that is why Sunday morning, nowadays, people don't go to church anymore. Because they know what's going to happen. And that is why we keep praying for, uh, pray for Nigeria every day. My family and I will pray for them every day. Because it, 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 it's tough. Some have relocated, some ran away to other countries, but it doesn't solve the problem. Because the Bible says righteousness exalts a nation. The sin is a reproach to any evil. And so we keep praying every day that the Lord God will help us and the Lord God will sustain us. It's the same thing with this country. Look at what's happening in Ferguson. It's trouble every day, killings every day, problems every day. Just as you think it's going to be peaceful today, something happens somewhere else. And that is why we need, as people of God, to prepare ourselves. Because the day and hour nobody knows. And if Jesus doesn't even come, people come to him. But are you ready? Are you prepared? I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Now this day we are we're going to look at something that I think we can possibly ponder on for, 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 for a while. One of the challenges I see in the world today is everybody wants to be known. Everybody wants to be famous. Everybody wants to be recognized. Everyone wants to be given an honor. Everybody wants to be given a position of authority. 
Everybody wants to be a reference point. Everybody wants to appear first page on each magazine. Everyone wants their pictures taken. Paparazzi run after them. Everybody wants fame. Nobody wants to be relegated to the background. And that is what I told I told my church members some years ago when I traveled to Nigeria. I said, if a man who doesn't know what it means to be a pastor, who would want to overtake a pastor? If you know what that responsibility is, you will know that it's an a head that doesn't lie peaceful. What touches one church member touches you. You don't sleep at night because the church member doesn't sleep. You're troubled because somebody's in a hospital. And that is why in the body of Christ today, we have so many people who are just sitting idle. We leave everything for the leader. We leave everything for somebody else. But we need to recognize that God has called us into fellowship with his dear son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says he, he saved us for good works. There's a story of a boy. I just want to say very briefly, it's a very touching story. I've said it so many times. And the reason why it touches me is because he did this act when the father was not aware of what was going on. And all we're trying to do this morning is, what will you be remembered for? When you pass out of this life, what are we going to remember about you? This boy was a nine-year-old boy, went to the farm with his father. They had a fence around their farm. And they knew that they had just finished cultivation and they were planting. And while they were planting, they heard the hunters. They were riding horses and they were coming. So the father told the boy, his name was John, he said, John, go to that gate and close it. Don't let anyone come into the farm. Because if these horses are going to turn on what we are planted, that means we've just missed it all the time. So John just ran to the fence and closed the gate, and the men showed up. And the first man stood up and said, Foolish boy, open that gate and let us pass. Because it was a very large farm. And the boy said, My father says, No one will pass here. So the second man brought out some money and said, Take this money. Your father will not know we were here. Just take this money and let us pass. And the boy said, My father says, No one will pass here. Until the third man got down from his horse. He said, I am the Duke of Wellington. And my orders are obeyed without question. I command you to open that gate and let us pass. Then John remembered that the Duke had just conquered Napoleon, who was rated as the most successful fighter on the face of the earth. Then. And John thought to himself, How can I defy this man's order? And so John bowed his head and said, I am honored to stand before you. But surely the Duke of Wellington will not make me disobey my father's order. <laughs> and you'd be surprised at what the Duke did. The Duke himself removed his hat. He said, I bow before a boy who cannot be bribed or frightened into disobeying his father's order. Brethren, any man who obeys God, people may not recognize him. They may say evil things about you. They may even speak things you never did. They may accuse you falsely, but they will always respect the fact that you will not. And the reason why God has called each of us is the greatest people I have always respected are people, if you check the scriptures, people whose names are never even mentioned as having said anything. There are so many of them. Never said one word. But at every point, the Bible challenges us to look at the lives of these words. There are so many of them written in scriptures, never said anything, never, I mean, they did remarkable things, but they never said one word. Look at Timothy. One word. But look at all the work that this young man did. Awesome. The same thing with so many people in the Word of God whose lives are so remarkable, but you never heard them say one word. 
in this life today, we have so many of them like that. William Carey, Hudson Taylor, Jim Elliott, and the Minister John Paul of Bristol. There's so many. And you know what God is looking for? God is looking for men in the body of Christ who will do the work of God without seeking recognition. Men who will go down on their knees and pray for the body of Christ and for the glory of the Lord and for the wisdom of God and for the preaching of the gospel and for the expansion of the glory of Christ without coming to say it. Those are the kind of men God is looking for. Those are the kind of women God is looking for. See, there was a man who wrote this morning. He said, many sit at the table of Jesus Christ, but only a few will fast with him. The sorrow, they say, the, the sorrow come of anguish travels to the grave, but few watch with him in the garden. Who have sung with him? How many people watch with Jesus Christ in the garden? Ah, they fell asleep. He said, many will confess his wisdom, but only few, few people will embrace his shame. Many will smile upon them. We praise his name, but for a while, when he tests them, they leave him alone. Brethren, God is looking for men who will take it upon themselves to find the battle of faith. Our text is taken from Philippians chapter 2. We look at the story of a young man who did just that. Philippians chapter 2. Our reading will be taken from Philippians chapter 2. Between verse 25 and verse 29. If you have seen it, this is what the Bible says. Philippians chapter 2. Between verse 25 and verse 29. But I think. It is necessary to say that to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to send him sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor men like him. This was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was writing this to the Philippian Christians. See, in Asia, there was a war. We are told that the church was building, they were trying to build a new church, and it was taking so long because everybody was very poor. There was not much money. And it happened that this boy was a farmer. And he was working along with his dad. And the dad wanted to contribute something to the church. So he sold one of the cows that he used to farm. And this was what the boy did. This was, this was the reason he gave. The boy asked the dad to sell one of the cow so that he would not do the work of one cow. They had to tie a yoke on this boy so that he can begin to do what the cow had always done. And you know what that means? It, it wasn't an easy task. It was tough. It was rough. But the boy did it. Now do you know that if that church building is complete, who would ever think of that boy as having done that? Nobody. But you know, my greatest joy, God has a record of everything anybody does. A record of all the songs we sing, a record of all the churches we come to, a record of all the rain, all the snow we come into, to come to church, all the work we need. I mean, all the sleeping and all the cooking and all the progress and everything. God has a record of everything. And so if anybody should give us a reward, it should be God himself. And if there's any recognition that we would ever seek for, it should be the one from God. But the Bible tells us that God provides us. He was not a statesman. He was not even an apostle. And there was not even any indication that he was a, an elder in Philippi. 
The record we had was that he was not anything dynamic. He was not anything dramatic. There was nothing unforgettable about his character. There was nothing exciting about him. He was just an ordinary church member coming to church, attending Bible study, coming to a prayer meeting. But the Bible tells us this man became the hero of the common man. And how did he become that? His name appears only two times in the New Testament. And the story tells us that he, he comes from a, 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 a Greek name, Aphrodite, which was one of the charming pagans. So that means he had a charming pagan background. So he was not even originally a Christian. And history tells us he may have been converted when Paul visited Philip Paul. So, how did this happen? The story tells us that the Apostle Paul was jailed for two years in a private house. And as a result of that, he could not do the things he had always done for himself. But the Bible tells us he was a tent maker. He was no longer able to get any money. He was no longer able to get any help. But he still had some freedom for ministry. And so the Apostle Paul needed help. And the church realized this and decided to send somebody to help him. And the person they found was a Epaphroditus. And all they did was to send money and help with some personal needs. I said, please, take this to the Apostle Paul. And you know what he did? When he got that, the Bible tells us in verse 25, he said, but I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother. What brought this kind of relationship was the fact that in the Christian life, anyone who knows Jesus Christ as his personal savior is a brother. You know what Dr. Edwin Mayer said? He said, whilst we need to devote my energies to those with whom I believe necessarily aligns me, I refuse to be made denominationalist. He said, I glory most in being the brother of all who love Jesus Christ in sincerity. For all who love the Lord Jesus Christ, they are brothers. And in the same verse 25, he calls him a fellow worker. He was not preaching with him. He was not writing the pieces with him. He was just helping the apostle Paul to do what God has called him to do. I pray that the same thing with all of us. For all of us who have the servant of God, washing his clothes, giving him food. I know for most people they think that oh, those, those are servant jobs. They are not. Jesus Christ told the disciples, for anyone who gives a cup of cold water to an apostle because he's an apostle, what reward do you get? An apostle for reward. And that's what the Bible is, is teaching us this morning. He calls him a fellow soldier. Like somebody who was fighting the battle with him. He knew the hardship that was in preaching the gospel. He recognized that fact and he said, Your messenger, the one you sent to me to help with my needs, the one you sent to me to be of much comfort for me, the apostle Paul recognized him as the one who helped me. Brethren, what we are getting at this morning is this. For everything we do in this life, we will always be remembered. Mike Woodlock said, a man is remembered for two things. The problems you solved or the ones you created. And that is why when people die, the things we keep talking about are the things that they think that were awesome. Oh, he was good. Oh, he was wonderful. In Africa, we are always told we don't speak evil of the dead. Once somebody is dead, even if he killed somebody or did anything, we don't talk about it anymore. And that is why if you see funerals, every time we come there, even if there was a problem between us and this dead person, nobody wants to mention it and oh, he was awesome. <laughs> Meanwhile, in your heart, you're happy he's gone. Because at least part of your problem is solved. But in this life, what we are today, what we are doing for God today, we need to see them and reevaluate it. Because where we, we are where we are because this is what God has sent us to do. Sometimes people come into a church. They come into a congregation. 
You want everything done. You want somebody to pray for you. You want everything done for you. You want everything go. Just to go the way you want. Brethren, if we are in the body of Christ and God is still looking for somebody to use, you know what the Bible calls that? You are simply unprofitable. Unprofitable. And that's the problem we have with the body of Christ today. Nobody wants to do anything. You want to come to church, sing, praise, dance, and pray for you. Next Sunday, you do the same thing. What do you do for God? Nothing. That's why I was so challenged by that sister's testimony about going out to talk to people about Jesus Christ. What was the last time you told somebody Jesus says? What was the last time you picked up a church and said, let me give it to somebody who is not saved? When was the last time you saw it as a responsibility that God has called us? In Matthew, he says, God, he said, He said, Go in my name. And make disciples of all nations by passing them in them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and Lord, I am with you always. When was the last time you ever did that? For anyone who has not done the things God expects. It becomes difficult for God to be able to move you to the next step. Because if you don't do the first, the second may not naturally fall. And that is why Epaphroditus went to the Apostle Paul to help them. If you check through the book of Romans, especially when the Apostle Paul writes letters, he would always say, Oh, he mentions so many names, names of people, names of this person did this, this person did that, pray for this person, give that permission to that person. The reason why he does that is to let them know that he is happy that they were part of the body of Christ. But when we look at the Paphroditus, the Bible tells us that this man labored for the sake of the Apostle, Apostle Paul. Now that is why you cannot become meaningful to anybody until you become meaningful to God. When God begins to recognize your life as a serious person, He makes you not just meaningful to yourself, but you become meaningful to others and you become meaningful to the body of Christ. But well, within the body of Christ today, just like uh, Montabo in Ecuador, he said, he said there is nothing harder than the than the than, than, the, than the, the, the softness of it difference. That's what we define the body of Christ today. Oh, can you come to prayer? And go, oh, yeah, no, we we'll come. We'll be praying from your home. We'll be praying elsewhere. We are praying. We are praying for you, brethren. Let's be very careful because if all that the Paphroditus did was helping the Apostle Paul and recognition was given, only God knows how much we labor every day on our knees and how much God will give up this answer to that. God knows what we are doing. He knows what we are going through. He knows the pain and agony, but He also knows that if we don't do what He expects, we are not just disobedient, but we are different. True humility is seen in our submission to spiritual authority. There is nothing that shows how humble we are than when spiritual authority is exercised and we exercise humility. When the body of Christ expects us to do some things, then do it with all your heart. When you are given the responsibility within the body of Christ and you are asked to do it, do it with all your heart. Epaphroditus was sent to help the Apostle Paul. He stayed there and lived there and served him. Sometimes he could, I'm sure he would have been washing his clothes and cleaning his shoes and doing all those things. And in this world today, many of us would say, How does that mean serving God? There is nothing as great as doing the little things if it is done for the sake of the world. If you are in the world of Christ and God is still searching for those to use, then there's something wrong. And that is why I've always told people every time, it is better to be hated for what you are than to be loved for what you are not. Let people hate you for the fact that you are committed to God. 
Let them hate you and be different to you because you do the things God expects of you. Let them see you as something very foolish because you are always listening to divine instructions, you always follow directions from the Most High God. Let them see that in you. That is the greatest joy you can ever get. Because when we get together at the marriage supper, when the saints are gathered for the last assembly, the Bible says, No more sad hearting, no more heart to be broken. If you find well to sorrow, then the saints will be rewarded. The one after the other. There was a story that was told about what happened in heaven. Now, I don't know, if, I don't know how true this is, but because it, it looks like it was an assumption. They said they got to heaven and God was giving rewards. And there was a pastor in, the, in heaven who felt he needed to be given more reward because he had a congregation ministry to them and we're told that there was a woman in, in his church who was given more reward. And the pastor was surprised. I, I went back to God and said, no, how did this happen? She was my church member. I was praying for her. I was helping her. And then God now told the pastor, if not for this woman, he would have had no ministry. They said, this woman made it a point of duty to pray for you every day and every night. To sustain your work. To keep you on your toes. To help you in your work. To do the things God expects of you. Brethren, the greatest strength we can ever get is the ministry that is anonymous. The ministry that has no pronouncement. And that was why when Nehemiah and Esther were facing this problem coming from Haman. Nehemiah told Esther, do not think you will escape. Because believe and believers is going to come from the Jews from another, another place. He said, but you and your fathers will perish. But he said, who knows? If God has brought you into the king's palace for such a time as this. I know you might be sitting here this morning. You might be wondering why you are in this church. Brethren, wherever God has placed you, he is simply giving you the privilege to be his instrument. If you forfeit that opportunity, you will look for somebody else. Look at what happened to Moses. When Moses began to complain, that was how his brother came into the picture. He was the one that was small. Whatever God has committed into your hands, do it to his Lord. Whatever work God has given and asked you to do, do it to his face. Because little things are important to God. What we call little things. Did you remember Dorcas? In Acts chapter 9, the Bible tells us after she was dead, people came. Look at what she did. Look at what she did for us. Look at this little thing she did. Whoever knew she was doing all that? What was she like? And for the sake of all that, you have to call Peter and say, no, this woman has to get up again. Because she, does, she doesn't get up in trouble. And that was how she was raised to life. Are you doing what God expects of you? Or have you ignored the instructions of God? There was a lady who was sent to a hospital. I was told it was somewhere in the south. And the Holy Spirit specifically told her to go to the hospital and pray for a man who was sick. And the Spirit of God said, if you pray for this man, he's going to be healed. Go now. And she had food on the, on the, on, on the stove. And she said, well, once this food is done, I, I, will, I will run down and take her a place. The food was like 10 minutes to be done and she said there are and all that. Two minutes later, I told the Holy Spirit said, go now. This man is dying. Go and pray for this man. She said, that, well, the food is almost done. Just eight minutes more and I'll be done. And, and that was it. And she said, by the time she got to the hospital, there was a bed that was rolled past her. And it was a white sheet covered, covering the bed. And so, she went down to the room the Holy Spirit told her, and the, the place was empty. And so she asked the neighbor, where is the man who was supposed to be here? And they told her the man died two minutes ago. And they just took him away. And see, the, 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 the trouble was that she said, 
From that moment, the spirit never falls apart again. Brother, if God has given you an instruction and you refuse to do it, when you do not do it, you know, sometimes we get so ashamed, or sometimes we get so, I mean, so caught up with circumstances, we feel like, am I sure this is God talking? Am I sure this is God really saying this? Brethren, if you give a track to some, if God compels you and says, give a track to some, if you give them, there the, are the only two responses. They either take it or they reject it. If there's any shame, it doesn't come to you. It's just like when we pray for the sick. If they get healed, you can do it. If they are not healed, it wasn't your fault. The God of heaven is the authority. The Bible tells us he does what he wants. He does it at his own place, in his own time. So where is the problem? The corner you live in, make it bright. Because somebody far from Jesus may look at your life from afar. You never know who's watching. And that is why the songwriter says, Fading away like the stars of the morning, losing their light in their glorious sun. Those will win past from this earth and its points only remember that what we have done. All people remember is what we have done. The record God has is not a record of good intentions. Oh, if I make 10 million, I'm, I'm going to turn America around. I'm going back to my village. I'm going to build a hospital. I'm going to do this. You're making 500 and you can't even pay your tax. You're making 200 and you can't even give it to God. A man who is faithful in a small thing will be faithful in a big thing. And a man who is unfaithful in small things, even if you give them a big thing, is a sex story. The man who wrote, if I tell the story at the end, you might recognize his name. See, he, he wrote a book. He said the first time he told his wife, he said, from now on, this is what we are going to do. Because sometimes we think if God asks us, I mean, if God expects us to pay tithe and give offerings, we think he's trying to, he's trying to make us poor. He's taking our money. It's not your money, my friend. It has never been. Because without his strength, you wouldn't even go out in the first place. So this man told his wife, he said, every year we're going to, instead of, since God expects a 10%, we're going to increase it 1% every year. And so they can't do it. 12%, 13%, 14%. And you know what God did for him? Until he wrote a book, The Purpose Driven Life. Do you know how much he made from that book? 36 million. And that was when that guy became known worldwide. And how much do you think God has blessed him? If God is asking you to bring, He is not asking you to bring so that He will empty you. He's asking you to bring so that what you never labor for, He will give it to you. The favor you don't deserve, He will give it to you. That, that is the kind of God we have. And so he keeps a record of all this, like Epaphroditus. He said he labored. In fact, the Bible tells us he almost died serving the Apostle Paul. We might call him a servant. We might call him, call him every name. But the Bible tells us he was a servant of God. Because he served God with all his heart. How many of us will want to remain anonymous? You serve God. Not because you want your name to be mentioned, but because you want God to give you the reward. During the World War II, there was a marine who was serving in the, in the Southern Pacific. And we were told that his platoon was under fire. And so they were trying to signal their comrade, uh, comrades that they had taken a certain deal. So the sergeant issued an order for a man to take the American flag. And raise it up on the pole to let the other units know that they had taken that hill. So one of them grabbed the flag, ran up the hill. Before he could put the flag down, he was shot. <coughs> so the commander said, Somebody else has to go. 
So they called somebody else, the next person went, ran up the hill, before he could pick up the flag from where the last guy left it, before he could go down like this, he was shot. And finally, a young, a young private came and spoke to the commander. And this was what he said. He said, Sergeant, in just a few minutes, it will be 4 o'clock. If you will let me wave until then, I will put that flag and I will raise it up on that pole. And the sergeant thought for a moment and said, okay, no problem. So when it was 4 o'clock, that private jumped out of his foxhole, where told he ran over, picked up the flag, and then ran to that pole and raised it up, put it down firmly, and ran back into his hole. And everybody was sharing for him. But the question was, how come the others couldn't do it and he did it? And this was what he said. So they wanted to know why 4 o'clock. And he said, well, sir, it's 4 o'clock here, but it's 6 a.m. back in Kansas. My mother loves Jesus. And she told me that every morning at 6 a.m., she will be on her knees and praying for my safety. I knew that I would be safe while my man touched heaven for me. That was different. Sometimes we tell people I'll pray for you. Before we come out of the church, we forget. That's a good. If you do not want to do something, do not make a commitment. The mother prayed. The captain never knew there was a mother who was praying. But the boy knew that if my mother tells me she's praying, she's praying. Look at the difference in prayer made. What two people failed and they were shot and killed, this young boy went there and did it because somebody was praying for him. Pray. What are you doing for God? That's the challenge we have this morning. The church is looking for some school teachers. Church is looking for people to, to clean the, the, the building. The church is looking for people to do so many things. You sit down, you listen to this every day, you hear everything, and you go home. What are you doing for God? The men we are reading about did something. They never thought of something. They never sat down to plan about something. They did. You may have a million good intentions, but it doesn't do one thing. Until intentions become active, that's when they become good. The Bible makes it very clear to us that one day we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And every man will be given a reward according to his works, not his words. Not according to what you said, it's according to what you did. What are you doing for God? What activities do you do for God? How many times do you come for prayer meetings? How many times do you go out to evangelize? How many people have come to know Jesus Christ through you? How many people have been challenged by your Christian life? How many things have you done for God this, this last week that you can say, oh yeah, I did this for God? How much time do you commit to prayers? What activities do you take part in that you know that I did this because it was God that called me to do it? What has God called you into? Or you think like extra, you will escape? There's no escape. The Bible says there's no escape. He has a record of everything. One after the other. All the things we have been doing for God. So what is your record showing? Is it good? Everybody goes to school and comes back with the results. What's your result like? That's why the Bible says, do not put your treasure in earthen vessels. Because the rough and the moth, they eat them up. He said, but put your treasure in heaven. When there's no moth, there's no rough, nothing can touch it. And that is where we need to be. That is what we need to do. And that should be our greatest desire. But then I know that today, it's possible there are some of us here who have not known Jesus Christ. The day of grace is passing and soon shall be no more. 
the day of repentance will soon be gone. If this world collapses, and especially if the trumpet sounds, and the dead in Christ right, and Jesus shows up in the sky, all who believe in Jesus Christ will meet him in the air. You will be left behind. But you can be saved today, right now. Salvation is free. And you're giving your life to Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about coming to church because you're already here. If coming to church says that only God knows how many people will be saved. But it is, the Bible says if you confess it among the Lord Jesus and believe in a heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And you confess with your Lord Jesus Christ and you're giving your life to Jesus Christ. And if you're working for God today, I want to encourage you. Keep going on. I pray the Lord will strengthen you to do much more. I pray the Lord will give you the greater wisdom to do much more. Because in one day, in one day, it shall all be over. So that by the time we come before Jesus Christ, when your name is called, when you're given a reward for all this labor, for all this joy, for all the many hours you kneel down to pray for others, for all the troubles and difficulties you take into preparing sermons, studies, many things, they will never be listening. Brother, that's my prayer for each of us, that you will be in heaven, and that you will get a reward. But begin to work now. That's what we're doing. Do the best you can. Work for God. Out of season, in season, even the ones you are not expected to do them. People may call you names. They've done that before. They did it to so many people in scriptures. But look at all the things that they became. The apostle Peter. Look at all the apostles. The Bible says after Jesus left, this man turned Jerusalem upside down. People who never knew them before knew that, oh yeah, there's somebody in this town. So that when you stand before the judgment seat, God will give you a reward. I do not think there's any greater joy than when you get to heaven and you say, Well done, good and faithful servant. There's nothing as joyous as that. It's just like the president calling you here this morning and said, I said, Pastor Chris, well done. You know what that means? The president of the nation. How much more God in heaven looking at you and said, do that for yourself. Enter into the joy of your master. You will bring things of life. You know, all the sorrows and labors will have all been forgotten. And you will enter into this joy. But let it not be that you get there and he says, I don't know you. And so, no, they, they have my records in the new life from the new church and I pay my ties at it. So, I don't know you. I think that will not happen to us. I think that will not be something we will experience. So it's best to settle it here before we get there. Because if you are going to heaven, you will know it from here. Because the Bible says, he who believes, and he who does not believe, is going to never work. So if you don't believe, there's no heaven. But if you believe, you are sure your name is written in the book of life. I pray that the Lord God will strengthen each of us to do that which will honor him. And I pray that as we leave every day, the Lord yes. Greater excitement, serve the Lord in our heart, knowing that one day we will be remembered for what we have done. Shall we go ahead for prayers? And the Father, we thank you for today. We're grateful because you have brought us here for a reason. We're happy because Epaphroditus served the Apostle Paul, and by extension, he served you. And Father, we thank you because it's a story we can learn from, and especially for the many people who have served you. Many of them never got recognized by anybody, but you know them. You know their names. There's no anonymous name with you. You have a record of everything we are doing to serve you and to honor you. 
Father, may we serve you to the end. May we believe you to the end. Give us the strength, O oh God, to do that which will honor you. I thank you for blessing us. Father, we pray for this assembly. We ask your blessings upon everyone here. We pray that they will grow from strength to strength. We pray that your wisdom will be blessed in you. We pray that the direction and focus, O oh God, will be their portion. Father, we ask that you will constantly strengthen all who serve you. Give them greater wisdom. And give them greater insight into your word because you are a faithful God. We bless you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. 
Thank you for gathering us together this morning. Thank you for being with us and for speaking to us. All we ask you this morning in the name of Jesus to write your words in our heart now. And we may not sin against you, God, but we live a life that is needed to you. And that our lives will be a living testimony for you, God. And the other part of the darkness will see and come to know you. Come to know you like you turn. Father, as we are both separate, right now we ask you, God, to just go before us. Destroy the ones of the devil, God. Bless the Holy Spirit. That is not of you. And take us over, God, and our Father, we pray today. In peace and safety. We ask this blessing in the mighty name of Jesus. We the trust. If your voice has saved you, if you are. Oh, God, brother. Live the life that God called you to live. Amen.